Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm happy to present today joint work with Dennis, Axel, and Justus. Um, Axel and Justus are actually on the job market this year, so you should check out their websites, of course. Uh, the title is Mechanisms with Design or Mechanisms Without Transfers for Fully Biased Agents, and let me give you like a motivation for what we're doing. So, in many classical uh, settings of mechanism design, the designer has two tools at his disposal. There's an allocation rule and a transfer rule. And the nice thing about having transfers, or one of the nice things about having transfers, it, is that it gives the designer really a, a great flexibility in incentivizing the agents in order to report their private information truthfully. But um, there's actually a lot of environments where monetary transfers are not feasible. So you can think, for example, about allocation of resources or tasks within an organization. You could also think about um, judicial or political decisions. Um, and these are the kinds of settings we're interested in today. And you can think of any of these examples here um, to interpret what we're talking about today. So we consider basically the, the simplest possible setting that you could imagine here. There's a, a principal who has to take a binary decision. And there are two agents that hold some private information that is relevant to the principal's preferences over, um, over this decision. This information will be allowed to be correlated in any way. And the agents have opposed preferences that are fully biased in the sense that the first agent always prefers the first decision and the second agent always prefers the second decision no matter what are their, their information. So only the designer cares about this information. And uh, in this sense, the agents are what we call fully biased. And then we ask what mechanisms can be implemented here? And can the principal do better than choosing her ex-ante preferred option? Which is not so obvious, really, because as I said, there is no transfer, so the designer is quite restricted. OK, so here comes the model. Principal's decision, left or right. The agents we also call left and right. Each agent has a type, privately known, drawn from some finite type space. And the joint type distribution, pi, can be anything arbitrary. Preferences are as follows. So um, the principal's payoff from choosing decision L is V of theta L theta R, where theta are the types. And we assume without loss that uh, the principal's payoff from decision, zero, uh, from decision R is zero. So this is simply a normalization. And we assume also without loss that R is the ex ante preferred decision of the principal, right? And uh, yeah, agent L always prefers option L and agent R always prefers option R. You can think, for example, of an allocation decision, right? Where each agent would prefer to get the object always. So the principal designs and commits to a mechanism. What's a mechanism in this setting? Well, you could imagine any kind of negotiation scheme. Maybe it can be uh, dynamic, multiple rounds, doesn't matter. The revelation principle tells us that it's without loss to restrict attention to um, direct incentive compatible mechanisms. And such a mechanism in this setting is simply a function that assigns to every reported type profile a probability of choosing L, option L. So here's, a, here's an example. Principal could be a division manager overseeing uh, two departments. And um, the department heads, left and right, um, they hold some private information. And the decision is how to split some fixed budget between these two departments. Um, this private information captures the determinants of the expected margin return of um, allocating money to these two departments. And the principal's objective here would simply be to maximize expected return. And given our normalization, this V would simply be the, the difference between these marginal returns. OK, principles problem. There's a linear program. Simply choose a mechanism um, in order to maximize expected payoff subject to these incentive compatibility constraints, which say that um, agent L, by reporting truthfully, maximizes uh, given his information, the probability that the principal would choose L. 
And the right agent, by reporting truthfully, minimizes from his point of view the probability that the, uh, that the principal will choose R. Okay, so this is the um, characterization of implementable mechanisms. Don't look at this formula. Uh, mechanism X is incentive compatible under type distribution pi if, and this is what the formula says, suppose I'm an agent and I think about, so my type is five and I think about should I report truthfully five or should I report seven or three instead? What this condition says is that I should be indifferent between all of the possible reports I could make. And in addition, no matter what is my true type, I should expect to receive the same expected payoff. So kind of from the, the, the viewpoint of each agent, this mechanism is constant. Um, and the, the proof of this is based on a dual way of looking incentive, at incentive compatibility in this setting. Namely, we, um, we consider a related zero-sum game. Um, and it turns out that actually a mechanism uh, in our setting is incentive compatible under some type distribution, pi, if and only if pi is a correlated equilibrium in this related game. And note that at the outside, x is endogenous, while pi is a part of the environment, whereas in this related setting, pi is endogenous, while x, which, um, uh, which defines the related game, is part of the environment. So we kind of take a dual view and why, why is it useful to do this? Well, uh, there's actually a lot of theory on correlated equilibria, right? And this, this view kind of allows us to apply all of this nice theory to our setting. And in particular, we're able to um, apply classical results by Rosenthal and Aumann, which tell us that in the correlated equilibrium of a two-player zero-sum game, no agent can uh, do better or worse than the, um, thank you, than the minimax value of this game. So this will be each agent's expected payoff, and this is where this minimax formula uh, above comes from. Okay, so here's a simple example. One, one thing you might be worried about, well, you know, from the point of view of each agent, this mechanism is constant, so can there really be so much more than actually constant mechanisms? Is, this, is there anything useful you can do? And in order to address this, let's, let's consider this very simple two by two example. So every agent, each of the two agents, uh, can have either type A or B. Uh, types are simply uniform, independent. And uh, the principal's objective is such that um, she would like to choose L whenever the types of the two agents match. And otherwise, she would prefer to, to do the opposite. So you have this uh, super modularity here, kind of, right? So the first best mechanism would be this, right? Positive assortment matching, if you like. Um, what happens if the principal would try to implement this? Well, suppose, suppose I'm, the, I'm the row guy, and my type is A, and I think about whether I should report truthfully or misrepresent my type. Um, if I report truthfully, well, with the same probability, 50-50, the other guy is going to have type A or B, so my expected payoff if I report truthfully is going to be a half. If I misrepresent my type, this is still true. Right? With the same probability, the other guy's going to have each of his types, so my expected payoff will still be a half. So um, I'm indifferent. From my, the, from my point of view, this is incentive compatible, and since everything is symmetric, the same holds for the other agents. And, actually, and so this implies that actually here, first best is possible. So you know, uh, this shows that actually there's some flexibility here, even though the incentives are quite strict. Um, how general this is, we're going to get to in, in a moment. But um, first, you know, one of the features of this model is that we allow for any kind of correlation, right? We don't have a lot of tools, but one intuition that you might have is uh, maybe we can somehow exploit this correlation, right? And um, this is kind of a, a folk intuition in mechanism design that usually the, the designer should be able to exploit correlation in some way, right? And at least in, in settings with transfers, this intuition is based in large part on the, the seminal results of Clem and McLean, who showed that in settings with transfers, if um, a full rank correlation condition holds, that was introduced by them, 
then the designer can actually implement anything he likes. And you don't even have to give the agents any information rents. So there's the strong intuition that correlation uh, should help us. And in order to you know, address whether, whether this is the case, we're going to look at the set of incentive compatible mechanisms as a function of the type distribution. And we're going to ask how, how it changes uh, when, when the type distribution changes. And uh, we're going to do this by defining an ordering on type distributions with um, independent distributions at one end and distributions satisfying the kremer maglin full rank correlation condition at the other end. We allow anything in between. And what we're going to find is that in stark contrast to the results of kremer maglin actually in our setting, correlation unambiguously restricts what the designer can do. So here comes the, the ordering. Pi spans pi tilde if each interim belief that an agent can hold under pi tilde is a linear combination of some interim beliefs that um, he can hold under pi. So um, the, the interim beliefs under pi are richer than under pi tilde. And I claim that in this in some sense, so this, this is a pre-order on type distributions, and I, I claim that this in some sense captures correlatedness. Why? Well, every pi spans the uh, type distribution with the same marginals, but uh, where types are independent, so same distribution, but you simply remove correlation. And these are actually exactly the, independent, the, 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 the minimal elements of this pre-order. Also, pi spans every other pi tilde, every other pi tilde, if and only if pi, when you look at it as a matrix, has full column and row rank. And this is actually exactly the kremer maclean full rank condition. And full rank distributions are actually exactly the maximal elements of our pre-order. So here comes the result. Um, if pi spans pi tilde, then the set of uh, implementable mechanisms under pi is smaller than the set of implementable mechanisms under pi tilde. So more correlation restricts what you can do. Um, if x is IC under pi, then it's also IC under when you simply remove the correlation. And um, if the full rank condition holds, then actually only constant mechanisms are incentive compatible. So you really have the stark opposite result of the Kramer McLean results. Kramer McLean tell us when you have transfers, uh, then full rank correlation allows you to do anything. We say in our setting, if the full rank condition holds, you cannot do anything. So it's really the opposite. So you know, going back to our simple two by two example, and we perturb this a bit. Uh, if epsilon uh, here is zero, as we saw, full first best can be implemented. But if epsilon is greater than zero, then full rank condition holds, and you cannot do anything anymore. Designer, the, 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 the best thing the designer could do in this case would be to simply choose her ex ante preferred option. Now. This is kind of how, how correlation affects this, uh, the set of incentive compatible mechanisms. But as, as promised, we're also interested in the question, when can the designer do better than choosing her ex ante preferred option? And um, so a mechanism is profitable if, you, if it, it yields a strictly better payoff than the ex ante preferred option. And in the paper, we consider arbitrary correlation structures. But today, I only want to talk about independent type distributions. Um, so I make one assumption. The principal is unbiased if she ex ante does not prefer one of these uh, options. Uh, this can be relaxed, but today I will talk only about the unbiased in this case. So we say that the principal's objective is additively separable, simply if it, if it separates in this way, standard, right? And then the result is that if types are independent and the principal does not prefer one of the options ex ante, then a profitable mechanism exists if and only if uh, her objective is not additively separable. So additive separability implies that you cannot do anything. But as soon as there is some kind of complementarity, the slightest complementarity between the, the types of the agents in the principal subjective, this can be exploited to define a, a profitable mechanism. And so you know, informational independence is kind of like correlation. It's kind of bad because it restricts what you can do. But value interdependence here is good because it allows you to 
exploit this by defining a mechanism in a smart way. And note that usually value interdependence, um, it's, it's viewed as something that makes things complicated, right? Because it makes incentive, uh, incentives uh, complicated. But here, we have value interdependence in the principal's objective and not in the agent uh, objectives. And this, this is what we're able to exploit here. So just going back to this, this division manager example here. Um, so recall that the principal's objective was simply the difference between the marginal returns of the two departments and um, conditional on the information. Now, suppose that it's the case that each, um, each department head, uh, his information is only relevant to the return of his own department. In this case, additive separability would hold and no profitable mechanism could, ex could exist. But now suppose it's the case that there are information spillovers, so one uh, department uh, head's information is not only relevant to the return of um, allocating money to his department, but he also knows something about the other department. He also knows something about the marginal return of that department. And then generically, this will not be additively separable anymore, and a profitable mechanism will exist. And this shows you that um, although the incentives here are really quite restrictive, there is still great latitude to, to um, to implement profitable mechanisms here. Um, so given the time, I think I will not be able to like, go over the proof very much, but the, the idea is, is basically a, a linear regression argument. So we look at the um, principal's objective as a, as a vector in function space, and um, then we look at the projection on the vector space of additively separable uh, objectives, and whenever this regression residual is zero, we're able to use this regression residual to construct a profitable mechanism. That's the basic idea for sufficiency. Actually, necessity is easy, so this is, this is the interesting direction. So I think I'm basically out of time, so let me stop here. So we'll have time. Thank you. So we'll have time for one question. So I have one. So effectively, is it, is it like the algorithm is trying to bring it to the case where like the example that you had that was everything was the same and like it was, they had to match like this was like this left and right case. So it was like either like oh, A, B, like there's either A, A or B, B. And mm -hmm. kind of like is it the proof that it's trying to construct that the, incent the incentives from the agents look like that, that they are indifferent from? Yeah, so the, um, so, um, I think I, I, I didn't quite so understand I, your question. So, Sorry. So my question was like, uh, from my mind, is, is your algorithm trying to bring the incentive structure similar to how this example was, where effectively anything that you do has equal probability of like failing or succeeding, like choosing? So, so um, the... I think I don't really know how to answer this question. <laughs> That's fine. Let's thank the speaker one more time. Okay. Sorry. Let's go.